tell these sharks to come in. There's blood in the water, my friend. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Welcome to Live from the Vault. My name is Shane Moran and I'll be your host for this episode. And from the entire Live from the Vault team worldwide, we want to thank you for your continued support. As you can imagine, the community keeps growing more and more every single week. And there's a lot to talk about during these historic times. And Andrew McGuire is in the house with our guest, Mr. Pete Antico. And we'll be talking gold in a few minutes here. So this is going to be an amazing episode, so fasten your seatbelts. You know, Live from the Vault gives you access to information and updates you just can't get anywhere else, and this episode is no exception. Just before we get to Talking Gold with Andrew McGuire and our special guest, Pete Antico, we want to hear from you, the Live from the Vault community, on who you'd like to see as a special guest on this show. And to have your say, simply click on the link in the description below and head over to our Twitter and simply reply to the tweet by tagging your dream Live from the Vault guest and we'll keep a close eye on the results. So with that, let me introduce our special guest here. Pete Antico is a macroeconomic scholar with a deep understanding of the global marketplace. He has two passions. Uh, one is finance and the other is film, and he's been able to combine finance and film. You know, he's an actor, a stunt coordinator, a producer, a writer, director, and he's recently directed The Paradigm of Money, which we're going to leave a link to that movie below. And this movie goes deep into the infrastructure of the global financial system and exposes the corrupt policies that allow a path for money to be transferred from the middle class to the 1%. When we have a monetary definition of economy, we fail to assess the all-in consequences of the actions that we take. The U.S. economy is reliant on this financial fraud to generate what they call GDP. Naked shorting simple version is a seller sells stock that they don't have to a buyer who sees it in their account electronically but it hasn't been delivered and the buyer gives the seller money, we call that stealing. We can't continue to have a system where Wall Street executives privatize all the gains and then socialize the losses. They create the drugs, they deal the drugs, they have no impunity for anything that might become negative as a result of that. Great job wasting my time. If you're going to filibuster, you should run for the Senate. We certainly have a legal system that really favors the wealthy over the common person. I, this is not some opinion. This is a mathematical fact. Tens of trillions of dollars are being extracted from the United States of America. If their goal was to try to force as many small businesses out of business, they would do what they've done. They can't legislate its way out of a box. Give me all those subsidies. I can make $16 billion. Actually, a trained monkey can make $16 billion. I think the gold price is rigged. One ounce of gold is underpinning 100 ounces of paper derivatives. The Fed is doing quantitative easing to infinity, printing money to oblivion. We're saying a new global monetary standard, which will be Bitcoin. They're nuts! They know nothing! And that's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that is a great lead-in. Um, I'm, I'm really privileged to welcome back Pete Antico. Uh, just for those people, I think one of the one of the, the good things, one of the things that really that I really like about this, and believe me, I think this is this is requ required viewing. But one of the things I like about this is this it actually, you know, we're so we get so involved in day to day. Uh, we're used to Wall Street uh, actions, you know, the 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 the. the the disrep disreputable actions that go on, but really, to this actually, this actually, uh, what it does is cast a net out to capture uh, more people, people who would be just ordinary people who have no idea of what is going on, uh, of the degree of manipulation and um, and and malfeasance that's going on. So, but Pete is. Just to say a little bit about Pete, he's a well-known actor. 
He's a stunt coordinator, producer, writer, director, director. He's an economic scholar. And really, I'm also very privileged to call him a friend. But I first heard about Pete after he consulted for Oliver Stone's Wall Street 2. Uh, and of course, he has a vast economic knowledge on on really how Wall Street's quintessential hedge fund managers operate. And I think this movie is simply going to open a lot of eyes. It's a documentary. I call it a movie. Now, you know, Oliver's uh, son, uh, Sean, was going to join us today. And unfortunately, he's traveling. Internet's really bad. So we're going to have to reschedule him for another time. But, you know, I just want to mention a little about Sean because he's joined us before. He's going to join us again. Uh, he has a very large influential following and a huge social conscience. So um, I'm going to ask him when he comes on, really what inspired him to produce this documentary. But first, Pete, please tell us about your journey. What inspired you to direct this movie? Well, I, you know, for I've been studying the markets for, you know, for a long time. My father in you know, 2001, 2002 introduced me to uh, Dow Theory Letters and Richard Russell. And uh, I, you know, I was stubborn at first because you're looking at a Wall Street newsletter. It was a very influential newsletter that was probably, that was the largest, uh, had the largest circulation or the lar largest um, you know, viewership or subscription base than any letter. And it was read all over the world. You know, it took me about six months. I was stubborn. Then I picked up a letter. My father gave it to me. I read it. I called him and said, now nah, give me another one. And then he sent me another one. Then I said, give me another one. And he said, I told you it was good. You shmule. <laughs> and I read it every day religiously after that. It was really brilliant based upon, uh, you know, the, the theory uh, that Robert Ray had uh, incepted that the transportation average, you know, and the Dow, if they were above their 50 and 200 day moving averages simultaneously, that would be a bull market. If they were below the 50 and 200 day, that would be a bear market. Or if they were in between, it'd be a non-confirmation. And you'd have to look at more of the internals in the, of the market, like the shipping lanes, the Baltic Dry Index, or the, re, or the Retail Holders Index. You know, they use Walmart for a proxy to see if people are actually buying. Uh, because when, you know, when the oil prices and gas prices goes up, uh, uh, as in today's environment, it squeezes the average you know, consumer. They don't have a lot of discretionary capital, so they're basically spending money on, on bills and, you know, electricity and, and natural gas and food and keeping a roof over their head. And they're not spending money on extra electronics or taking vacations because they, they don't have a lot of, you know, extra money to spend. So that's how, you know, inflation uh, uh, really damages the middle class. It acts like a, an invisible tax on the middle class. But, I, I, you know, I want to talk about this because in the United States, it's crazy. They, you know, they, they, our, our executive branch at our, our White House and our president are stating that it's, you know, Putin's inflation. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is complete fantasy, you know, to, to, for them to actually say that, you know, it, for all the, you know, economic you know, scholars and the uh, uh, the economic pundits to even buy that, to not challenge it and say it's completely false on a day to day basis is really amazing to me. I said they, you know, people forgot, you know, how to uh, how to be honest. It seems, uh, you know, it's not a function of that. It's you know they they increase the money supply ten trillion dollars in two years, you know, which an increase of thirty eight percent. How do they expect, you know, price inflation not to happen? I mean, the gas prices were up 66% before the, the war took place. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And, and, you know, nothing they say makes sense. And the supply chain disruptions that also caused uh, our, our commodity prices to go up is a function of, in my opinion, the detrimental responses they had to COVID. If you shut it down, you didn't need to shut it down and you shut it down. You destroyed the supply chain. And then you say, oh, and then you blame it on, on Russia because China shut down their seaports. And then, then all over the country, you have the same kind of behavior happening. And in and, and lieu of printing $10 trillion, and you have a, a debt that's about, I don't know, gross uh, debt to GDP. Global is about 356%, I think. And U.S. debt to GDP 
closer to 130 percent. The, and this is before the, the Ukraine war. So, um, you know, to blame that is just, uh, it's respectfully fantasy. So, um, you know, and a lot of the economic people that are, are absolutely saying this. But on the mainstream news, they let, you know, the, it's amazing they let the White House get away with, you know, putting that kind of uh, garbage out there. It's just nothing but redirection. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about time people started being honest and started pushing you know, a narrative that has no basis in reality. I think this is one of the things that's going to be so beneficial, Pete, um, is, is about this documentary. Uh, it's going to touch people that don't know any of this stuff. It's not because they're illiterate. It's simply because, as you just said, mainstream media does not focus on any of this stuff. So one of the things, the first th one of the first things that drew my attention to what I was so pleased to see how the, you draw attention to how Wall Street has enormous leverage over, uh, over the leg regulators. And if they've got leverage over the regulators, it, it kind of says we the people are supposed to accept that when the too big to fail uh, taxpayer funded banks and taxpayer funded by us, when they get it wrong, like in 2008, which you refer to, it's OK to socialize the debt. And um, even though any profit they would have done would have earned would have been privatized. And, and we're not talking about small amounts. We're talking about tens of trillions here. So if anyone thinks, but that was a bailout. And, and, and I'm going to ask you a little bit more about this. But if anyone thinks that bank bailouts have stopped, you just have to look at the bailout. JP Morgan and a couple of too big to fail uh, liquidity providers received just less than four months ago when the nickel market blew up. Now, I know you're a silver uh, addict here. You know, we're all silver addicts here. You know, Shane is going to be when he introduces these programs, he, you can see silver in his eyes. But basically, we're talking about something that leads into silver here, because what happened was when the nickel market blew up in these too big to fail banks faces, exposing them to billions of losses. In this case, the, 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 the regulators, oh, sorry, the of officials were able to ring fence these losses as it was contained in this little market called this LME. But now we see these liquidity providers, JP Morgan um, and, and others, racing to exit the silver market because before it does go nickel and blow up in their faces. The only difference is, Pete, as we know, Silver is a foreign exchange cross. It's not just some base metal trading in this siloed little world. So it cannot be ring fenced in the same way. You know, when you're long silver, you're short the dollar. When you're long the dollar, you're short silver. So it's a foreign exchange cross. You cannot ring fence it. So what I'm suggesting is, Pete, tell these sharks to come in. There's blood in the water, my friend. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know certainly the, the thing that's... Um that's really nefarious is, you know, insider trading, which is, is prevalent. And then you talk about JP Morgan. So JP Morgan, the five felony bank, I mean, Jamie Dimon is more, I think he's got, uh, you know, at least five felonies and the, the board has never, you know, let him go or demanded they have a new CEO. I mean, in 2008 to 2016, they were caught spoofing the gold, I mean, in the, the silver market. And uh, they got fined $992 million. You know, but but nobody goes to jail. It appears on Wall Street it's just the cost of doing business. I mean, in 2008, Goldman showed, sold the housing market shorts as they were selling it long to their clients. I mean, respectfully, I mean, that's a nefarious, you know, nefarious act because here you have your brokers saying, hey, this is good. And then you're you're taking the other side of the position. Um, and if, again, they, they got fined 500 million. I think they profited about one point five billion. So, they, I mean, they got they 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 got paid well they, for the cost of doing business. And and here's the question. The fines that are that are given by the, the SEC, who I call the captured regulator, they don't go to the people that got defrauded. The, you know, they go to the government so that, you know, the people get screwed several times. And, you know, hey, Goldman did, you know, or, or any, any financial organization that has been caught, you know, with their finger in the cookie jar. 
Um, very seldom, you know, do they, you know, get incarcerated. Most of the time they just get paid fines, uh, you know, but the people, you know, sometimes they get their, their capital back, but, you know, not much unless, unless there's suits, as in Robin Hood. You know, let's talk about that a little bit. So, you know, Robin Hood being a, an on, you know, a, a, a mobile trading app um, in the situation where you have GameStop. So the market maker is Citadel. And a market maker, for all the people out there, someone who who uh, does all, uh, executes the buys and the sells, but they pay for something called order flow, uh, and they give they gave Robinhood about 142 million uh, for the uh, uh, privilege of uh, trading and, and being the market maker, you know, for GameStop and and you know and other uh, you know positions, other companies. So they get to, to witness uh, on a day-to-day -day basis or a second-to-second -second basis the buys, the sells, the shorts, the longs, the volume, and the uh, derivatives or the, or the options uh, on, the, on the long and the short side. With that information, uh, you can front-run the market and make hundreds of millions of dollars. And if they did that, that would be, you know, against the law. You know, and, and people should also take note that Bernie Madoff, uh, when, when that Ponzi scheme came down, before it came down, uh, the SEC had six substantive complaints. They did nothing. Um, you know, Gensler, or, you know, the only one that did anything was Bart Chilton. Any other, uh, you, know, uh, you know, CFTC chairman, really, they really turn a blind eye, you know, to the b basically naked shorting on the LBMA when they have the leverage at 100 to 1 selling one contract to, you know, 100 people. And then the bottom line, if they take delivery, they can't do that. But as you know, with Basel III rules, you know, that has changed. However, the commercials are still, you know, playing their games in the marketplace. It's a, it's, it's a very interesting scenario that you have going on. I mean, the 10-year chart shows commercials covering gold short positions at the, at, from, from the, on the latest takedown, you know, in the, in the gold market. And that's, that's on a longer chart, a 10-year chart, the multi-decade ch chart. Uh, shows that the gold short positions are back in neutral positions. But however, in the silver chart, it's completely different. The commercial traders are, are now one of the most bullish positions in the last decade. So, I mean, I believe there's going to be a rebound in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in silver in short order. But, it, but it's really interesting. You know, people in the, in the mainstream news are saying the, the commodities market or silver, gold are going down because they got a high read in inflation. That's so counterintuitive. You got a high rate of inflation, you know, and real negative interest rates. That's the environment historically where, where gold and silver uh, blows up. Then you have Bitcoin, which has been untested, which which uh, t technically it is a good instrument because it's finite, meaning there's only a certain amount, and that's it. If the it, you know if they had gold and silver, it was finite, that or or the U.S. monetary supply, if that was finite, we'd have a strong dollar. So, you know, you know, and, that, and Bitcoin hasn't hasn't been tested. It's been, you know, pretty much following the Nasdaq. But now, you know, it's it seems to be a decoupling a little bit. It's trading at twenty two thousand, and um, I don't think a lot of people understand the technology. And I'm sure I've been a gold and silver bull for a long time, but I, I I'm really fascinated. I'm going to tell you, I'm really fascinated uh, with Bitcoin. A lot of people in the gold world aren't Peter Schiff and everybody, but I I think that the technology should be studied, and I think there's a a base case, and that's what I'll I'll say about that, you know, for now. But um, I, I I will say that it's you know in, in this particular environment where you have you know it's not runaway in inflation yet, but then you you, you have these problems of of you know easy money or, you know or like heroin that they had for the last you know twelve years that really was uh, prolificated by poor monetary policy and. I, by the Federal Reserve Bank. And since 1913, the U.S. dollar has been devalued or depreciated 98%. And in that same period of time, um, the interest rates have been in between 1% and 21%. So for the Federal Reserve to be given a job by our Congress, they're supposed to promote or stable interest rates and, and a strong dollar or a strong uh, 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 fiat, strong currency, they failed miserably. And since they, you know, Nixon took us off the gold window in 71 at Bretton Woods, 
the dollars depreciated another 98%. Now our, our dollars are backed by the good old faith of the U.S. government, which is perpetually bankrupt. So this is a very, you know, sordid uh, situation, you know, that we're in. Then you had the hundreds of thousands of businesses closed for COVID, you know, from March of 2020. You know, and a lot of those companies stayed out of business. And, and that's not reflected uh, on Wall Street. You know, it's, it's, again, a wealth transfer, you know, from the, you know, the middle class to the, to the 1% or the oligarchic class. Like 2008 was a, was a big wealth transfer. And the wealth transfer in 2008 was, again, due to deregulation and, more, and, and poor monetary policy. Greenspan was a proponent of deregulation. 1999, Clinton and Phil Graham took us off Glass-Steagall allowed banks to act as casinos or you know, act as broker dealers with the positive money. And instead, banks were designed as a utility, simple interest, certificates of deposit, real estate loans, a safe place to keep your money. And people should know from 1933 to 1999, there was never uh, a banking issue. There's only a savings and loan issue, but not a banking issue. So now you go off Glass-Steagall. And, and Bill Clinton doesn't agree with what I'm about to say is that you know, uh, I actually believe that uh, Glass-Steagall was uh, set the stage for a financial crisis. He doesn't think so. You know, when, when you're trying to say that you're, you're stymieing business, well, I think it was a traveler's, uh, uh, you know, insurance city deal that they wanted to merge and, uh, and that Glass-Steagall would have prevented that. But the, you're not thinking about, the, you know, how the, the, the banking system works, you know, because if, if you're allowing you know, Bank of America to act like Goldman Sachs and, and, you know, and get, and then lever themselves 30 to 45 to one. That's a recipe, you know, for disaster. And, and I remember Meredith Whitney going into Lehman Brothers and saying, you need to raise capital. And then, you know, four, three dif different times, you know, Dick Fold, John Fain from, you know, both company, him and Bear, they decided to say they were fine and they didn't. And those companies end up blowing up. But when a CEO hangs his hat on what he's saying, we're good, the stock's trading at 20 bucks and we don't need to raise capital. So people think, well, I got a 60% discount on the price and they put millions of dollars in it and the price goes to four, you know, under four bucks. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna lose money. Pete, if I could just pick up on a couple of things you said, really interesting stuff, really, really, really gets one thinking here. Again, another thing that this documentary brings our attention to is of course what a lot of people don't understand about naked shorting so you bring that in and obviously people who are watching this episode understand it very much but this documentary is going to people who won't understand it so it's going to be amazing when they look that you can realize that you can short a stock you don't have to a buyer who receives just this electronic credit never gets delivered and as you as this documentary says hey guys this is called sanctioned stealing. Now, look, this, the worse than that, the lack of regulations allows the weaponizing of this theft, not just to put companies out of business, but entire countries. And, and you mentioned the other part thing you mentioned was Goldman Sachs. Who bet against Greece was Goldman Sachs. And you also just mentioned the, the lockdowns and the, co and the COVID situation where entire economies were shut down. Who the hell was betting against it? You know very well, these banks are so well connected. They know what's coming down the pike. They know exactly what to bet on, long or short. What's your thoughts? And when I interviewed Jim Ricards, we were speaking about uh, um, when you have a counterparty risk, uh, as did, and, you know, Archegos Capital, um, you know, did, um, you have a, a gross exposure, but when one side defaults, the gross exposure still remains gross. You know, so Credit Suisse and all those banks that were uh, involved in Archegos, you know, lost a hell of a lot of money. Um, and, you know, you know, that happened, we didn't hear much about that. Uh, after that, you know, blew up. You know, it, it, the, the difference, you know, between obviously Main Street and, uh, and Wall Street is that, you know, they have a, too big to fail policy. And if somebody doesn't pay like their, you know, their loan, no one's gonna, no one is gonna, you know, bail me out. You know, it's like, the, you know, the government bails out banks for, you know, committing fraud and nefarious behavior. 
And, you know, if the general public just is behind on a credit card, they don't get bailed out. It's, a, you know, it's basically a, a rather uh, empirical system that works that way. And, and there's not a lot of accountability. Even in the, in the Congress and the trading, boy, you know, I, I, they were trying to make, you know, laws. And then uh, Pelosi had turned it down. They said, well, they should be allowed to trade. Yet you should be allowed to trade, but not using insider information. And as, as you can see, uh, you know, the... I think the congressional trading record was like, you know, something like 28 to 38%. I think it was better than any hedge fund manager in the United States. Um, if my memory serves me correct. How is that? How are people that are supposed to be public servants? Where do they get that information from? How are they more astute than Ray Dalio, you know, or, or David Einhorn or Tudor Jones or any of these really, really, you know, prolific, prolific, um, Economic minds. You mean to tell me they know more than Mohammed El Aaron? You, you, they don't. You know, they don't. Or Jeremy Grantham. You, you're talking about some, you know, really, really sound, sound, you know, economic minds that understand, really understand how to manage money. How is the Congress doing better than them? That's just a commonsensical question. You know, I'm not accusing them of anything, but how are they doing better? We, we live in this world. People are watching this episode of Life from the Vault. They know what we're talking about here. When we say shorting, when we say, you know, when we, we talk about these games that we run again, where we've got 500 to one silver, 100 to one gold, you know, it's, we see Ron Paul coming in and attesting to that. We see, you know, we see um, people you cannot question coming in and talking about these things. And I think it's so important um, that people do educate themselves. And I think the fact is that this goes out, this net casts out to a very, very wide audience. And so, Pete, can I ask you, um, how, how, where do you see this um, documentary evolving to? Where, where will it be ac accessible in the future, now and in the future? You know, we, had, we did a little test on the, uh, the paradigm of moneyfilm.com, but it's, it's now in a bunch of networks uh, that we're, 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 we're speaking to now about the mainstream distribution uh, of it. So, but right now you can find it on the paradigm of moneyfilm.com. Uh, you can find it there. Um, and, it, and all the players in it, obviously, you know, I, uh, the you know, audience, you know, I, I had a, a very nice interview with you about how the, the uh, silver market and the gold market uh, runs in the bullion market. And we should certainly state that um, the, the mainstream banks are, are certainly uh, buying uh, bullion hand over fist. And, and yet, you know, you know, the commercial short their own book. It's a really very, very, very strange practice. I mean, if you if the gold price was keeping up the rate of inflation, the gold price already would have been twenty five thousand dollars. It doesn't make any. It really doesn't make any sense um, to uh, you know the, how they're rigging the game, but they've been doing it for years. Central bankers own ninety eight percent of all the gold in the world. If they wanted to get out of their their debt, they just have to monetize it. Uh, they can monetize and probably get out of twenty five percent or thirty percent of debt by just changing. Uh, revaluing the price as they did you know, earlier on, you know, to, from thirty-five dollars. So uh, 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 in the Great, you know, Depression in nineteen twenty-eight. But it, you know, it's a uh, it's a different uh, marketplace now, uh, and you know, people that wish to protect themselves really have to buy you know assets that have some intrinsic value. Obviously, anyone with assets now, just you know, real estate or or collectibles are making lots and lots of money, you know, because as the dollar depreciates, uh, uh, the things with ultimate scarcity go up and up and up and up. You know, and, and respectfully for the gentleman, that, that for the for the Bitcoin world, uh, that's that's one of the use cases because I mean, one of the uh, prevalent proponents of it is because it has you know ultimate scarcity, uh, and it's it's the only. Uh, you know, blockchain that is truly decentralized. And th that's, you know, that's very important. And it's, it's also important to note that, that the market cap reached a trillion dollars faster than Facebook, Apple, Google, and Amazon, which is the market sending you a message. So there's just a, a few more points about that. And I'm in a, a vast study about that, but it's, 
it's been uh, it's been very interesting. Now going back to the gold and silver markets, these 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 markets should be tremendously higher. I mean, silver at these these prices, you know, trading over nineteen dollars is a steal. Um, the bottom line of the the gold mining and silver mining stocks are in the toilet, basically at two thousand and three prices. Um, uh, so that it really is counterintuitive. It's like the most unloved, uh, you know, you know, market, you know, in the world. It, 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 it's it's so interesting um, uh, the way that market is traded, and it's, it seems like there there's more negative sentiment in the gold and silver market. I mean, I, I, I think it's at one of the most extreme levels in in history if you look at the charts, which is a you know, uh, it's again the negative sentiment is uh, is I think counter cyclical and uh, uh, is a is a positive in that area. But, um, you know, if, if this keeps happening, I don't know how the middle class uh, continues uh, to survive. And, and if they try to put, pull back more uh, closures or lockdowns, I don't think the public uh, anywhere in the world will take it at this point because uh, you'll basically bankrupt the middle class while the people, you know, in the government still are getting paid a salary, which isn't fair. If they, if they really wanted to be fair, if they shut your business down, they should remunerate you at 100%. They should pay you 100% of your monthly uh, earnings. That's what you should get. And the bottom line is people that own homes, if they really wanted to help, um, if they couldn't pay their rent, it, they would freeze uh, all the mortgages. That, that means uh, people that own buildings, you know, people that own single family homes as rentals and mortgage holders, all of it should freeze uh, until they got the country back together. So they don't put people in nefarious positions where they're asking the landlords to pay uh, their mortgages while the renters don't have to pay and you can't, you know, kick them out. Um, and if they also really wanted to protect people, they would just turn around and give an executive order and give Medicare for all. Because if you have a pandemic, certainly people should be al uh, allowed and given the opportunity to, you know, get health care. And if you don't do that, like Michael Jackson said, they don't really care about us. So those are just, uh, you know, a, a few of my observations, you know, of, of common sense. But I, uh, I certainly think, uh, you know, you know, going forward, uh, the, this, the, the markets, especially in the, the gold and silver markets, who really should be thriving in real negative interest rates. I think their, their time will, get, will come as the dollar turns down because uh, the dollar is looking, uh, uh, you know, toppy. It could, it could potentially go, I think, to one uh, 120, but it's looking toppy right now. Once the dollar turns down in, in, in earnest, and if the, the market uh, uh, crashes or goes down uh, another 40%, which I'm in the camp that it will, it's a matter, I don't think it's a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And uh, I think, if, you know, that happens, the dollar turns down because you can't keep raising rates uh, into a, you know, into a, you know, real negative uh, environment where you have asset inflation, supply chain disruptions, because in 2008, we did not have supply chain disruptions. It's a different environment. In many ways, it's much worse than 2008, what we're facing now. You've outlined it well. And I think, you know, I wish we had more time. And, and I think what we'll do is we will circle back because um, obviously um, you're, you know, you, you're, you're the producer director side of this thing between you and Sean. Um, I think uh, as a producer, uh, we'd like to get uh, he because he's got the, I'd like his social side um, to why he wanted to produce this documentary, um, which is so important too. And and you've 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 already highlighted some of those reasons, exactly those reasons. So thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew McGuire and Pete Antico, for another fascinating discussion. And don't forget to check out the movie. The Paradigm of Money. Just follow the link below there. We'll insert it. And we want to hear from you. Don't forget our Life in the Vault community on who you'd like to see as a special guest on this show. And to have your say, all you got to do is click on the link in the description below and head over to our Twitter. Simply reply to the tweet by tagging your dream Life from the Vault guest and we'll be keeping a close eye on the results. And remember, buy physical and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They're not the same. Don't be fooled. 
And there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another episode of Live from the Vault. Please help us uh, by keep spreading the word about this channel and by liking, by sharing, by subscribing, and click on that bell if you'd like to be notified as each episode goes live. And with that, we will see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then.